first, I would like uh, for Tiffany to talk a little bit about what this initiative is, uh, just to kind of, you know, set the table for the discussion. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. And yeah, thank you for hosting this and for Councilman Morales um, being part of this as well. Um, so Initiative 135 passed in Febru on February 14th, which was a special election with a 14% margin of approval by the voters of Seattle to establish a social housing developer, the first of its kind um, on this side of the country. And the social housing developer will create publicly owned, permanently affordable housing in the city of Seattle that um, allows for affordability across a wide range of incomes. So the initiative says that those who make between 0% of the area media income all the way up to 120% of the area media income will be able to access this housing. So for the first time, uh, students, uh, educators, nurses, healthcare workers will be able, will be eligible for affordable housing. And this is, yeah, like I said, one of the first in the, the nations through a citizens initiative. We don't do it here in the city of Seattle. And it's finally investing in housing as a public good, not a commodity to be speculated against um, at the risk of people's lives. Thank you very much for that, Tiffany. I appreciate it. Um, and so I guess first, I'm going to throw this to both of you. Um, what comes next? You know, the... Uh, you know, this initiative passed um, with a pretty large majority in uh, most areas of Seattle, if not all. Um, but, you know, the devil is in the details. So how do we move forward from here? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me, Ashley. Good to see you, Tiffany. Um, so we are beginning the implementation phase. Uh, I have convened, so the the uh, the first job is to appoint the board, the governing board for this uh, public development authority. Um, and so that process is begun at council. There are um, several appointing entities. Council gets two appointments. Um, and so I'm convening the different appointing entities so that that process begins and we are, um, you know, accepting applications. People are vetting the uh, appointment the people who will be appointed. So we have to appoint, uh, seat the board by April 25th, um, sorry, April 30th. Uh, we have to seat the board and then have the first board meeting by May 30th. So that's kind of job one right now uh, is getting through that process. It's kind of a quick timeline uh, and making sure that folks are seated. And then um, the next step will be supporting that board in creating bylaws, uh, hiring staff and um, really, you know, creating the agency itself so that it can uh, have a solid footing as the work uh, begins over the next several months. And um, I mean, I know that you had sponsored a amendment in the budget that did not, if I recall correctly, ultimately pass that might have funded this uh, particular, or at least set the table so that it could have been funded. Um, how is the city gonna move forward with this now at this point? Yeah, thank you. Um, so you're right, we had uh, over the last couple of years tried to uh, add funding to the budget uh, to get this done. Um, right now, what we're working on is, um, I have been working for the last several months with Representative Chop and with Senator Saldana. Uh, to get some state funding through the state operating um, budget. Uh, we are hopeful that we'll get that. Uh, about $900,000 is what we've asked for startup funding for the first 18 months of the, of the agency. We'll see how that process unfolds. Uh, those decisions will be made very soon. Um, on the city level, uh, we are examining um, uh, uh, using the supplemental budget process to be able to uh, add at least some seed funding for the next short term amount of time so that this board can get set up, um, you know, finding office space for the staff that will be hired and really just looking at how we um, how we can put some city funding and some state funding together to get this process going. Mm -hmm. And Ashley, is it okay if I just jump in and lay out a bit more of what needs to happen in the next couple of months as dictated by the initiative? Sure, absolutely. 
Yeah. So just like a huge thanks to council member Morales for spearheading this through, through council and just like working really closely with the coalition to carry out the vision that we put forward and that voters approved. But yeah, in the initiative, we said that within 60 days of approval of the initiative, the first governing board needs to be established. There are 13 board members that will be um, on the governing board, seven of which will be renters. Um, and then you have two appointees from the council and one from the mayor. Um, El Centro de la Raza is the first uh, appointing entity for the community members who serve marginalized communities through housing. MLK Labor will have an appointee um, as well to the board and the Green New Deal Oversight Board is appointing a green development specialist to be on the board as well because for folks who don't know in the initiative, all new buildings have to be built to passive house standards. So we wanted to make sure that there is a, a green developer on the board from the from the go to help uh, implement that aspect of the initiative. So with, like uh, council member said, at the end of April, the board all needs to be um, appointed, put together. Um, as council member said, they have two appointees. The rest of the entities who are appointing their board members, those don't go through a council process. They just are going to tell council member Morales who they're appointing. And then within the first month, actually, as the initiative says, the first board meeting needs to be convened, which again, the council member will call. Um, and then time for bylaws, getting that um, job descriptions going for the, C the CEO, the chief executive officer, and the chief financial officer. So those are the first two positions that's mandated for the city to fund for the first 18 months. Um, and we did that in the initiative because we were not able to add a progressive revenue source. That's what we intended to do, but public developers don't have taxing authority we found. So in order to make sure that this didn't flounder, we wanted to give it some startup support while we continue as a coalition working on ongoing revenue. So that's just like a really quick overlay. And then we'll be working really closely with mm -hmm. the council member's office to get longer term funding and then um, make sure that right January 1st, 2024, money is released to, to hire these two key staff positions. Um, and I think it's a really good uh, segue into talking about what a public developer is. Um, what is this thing that Seattle voters have approved of, Tiffany? So yeah, we when we were drafting the initiative used a public development authority as the vehicle to establish social housing in the city. Um, we used it because we were able to have a lot of influence and input on the, the governing board. We wanted to make sure that this wasn't kind of the same cookie cutter approach when you're creating a new entity where it's just folks that are quote unquote experts or just like recycled in and out of boardrooms on the board. We wanted this to be very ground up, um, very uh, revolutionary, if you will, and visionary. So because we were able to have like all of that input and create the charter of the public developer, this is the vehicle we used. Um, as I said, we wanted to have a progressive revenue attached to it that was not permitted under the constitution. However, it does have bonding authority, which is critical. If the public developers in Washington didn't have bonding authority, we would not have gone forward with this vehicle, but it does have bonding authority. And that's really critical for social housing in the United States because that allows for um, bonding on future rents, taking out those debts um, to continue adding to the social housing portfolio and allows for which I imagine we'll get into later, like the financing option or financing aspect of social housing, but that also allows for like the cross subsidization. So folks that are making a little bit more income are helping to cross subsidize those at the, the lower end of the income bracket in housing. So that's, yeah, yeah, that's what's created is that like specific legal entity, but yeah, it'll create social housing that's focused on like union built, uh, very highest green standards through passive house, and uh, we'll create housing that is owned by the public forever. We specifically wrote in the initiative that no private entities can buy stocks, no stocks can't be sold. Um, there's no public private partnerships. This is truly staking out a course of public ownership of housing in perpetuity that can't be put on the, the financial speculative market. And council member Morales, um, I mean, you have been, uh, I, I, and push back on me if I'm overstating this, but I, I feel like you've been pretty supportive of this uh, for a while now. Um, why? Um, mm. Especially, you know, given that you have access to, you know, the Office of Housing and like those other kinds of 
um, policy kind of levers? Why why this measure? Yeah, thanks, Ashley. Um, so, you know, I first started understanding what social housing is um, when my uh, staff and I visited our sister city in France a couple years ago. We went to Nantes um, and really had the opportunity to meet with their housing folks with their uh, the folks who not just build the social housing, but folks who live there, um, the people who manage it. And it was really um, it, it was great to see like what this kind of very intentional neighborhood could be like. Um, it's an opportunity to mix family types, to mix incomes um, and really ending isolation of low income folks and, and working class uh, working class neighbors, which is really how we do affordable housing in this country. Um, this is an opportunity to, to do something different and, um, you know, meeting neighbors who are different from you can, it can create opportunity. It can create expanded networks and really increase understanding, um, of one another. So the idea of, of creating something intentionally in that way, I think, is really important to community cohesion. It's important to, as Tiffany was saying, allowing people permanent affordability so that they don't get pushed out of their neighborhood. They don't get pushed out of their community. You know, the way we do uh, affordable housing here is that, uh, you know, it's restricted by the kind of typically federal dollars or, you know, tax credit dollars, the, the, the financing mechanism itself restricts who can live in a building. And so if you, uh, you know, if you qualify for housing because of your income and then you get a raise, you get pushed out. Um, and that just contributes to more instability. So I, I think the, the part of the beauty of this model of social housing is that, um, is that you get to stay you get to you know, keep your kids in school, you get to stay in the neighborhood, and it really is an opportunity for folks to, um, to enjoy the luxury of housing stability, uh, which is not something that everybody in this country is able to do right now. I don't have kids, but both of you do. I mean, how important is that to be able to maintain that level of, of stability, of being able to go to the same schools? Like what, what does that mean for you and your families? Well, it's huge. I mean, right now we're, we're hearing about the school district having to consolidate schools, right? Because the school district is having a budget crisis. And what that means for some families is that their kids are going to, you know, their kids' school day gets disrupted. The travel gets disrupted. They have to make new friends. The, that, that kind of uh, routine is really important for for children's development. And so when that gets disrupted and we all know how critical the, the last three years have been, the, the real impact that that's had on students and their mental health, um, you know, it creates, it creates a lot of anxiety for not just for the kids, but for their whole family and for, for the community. So um, there's many, many reasons why providing a stable environment for, for kids is especially important. Yeah, and I would only add on to that getting into the, the social cohesion piece is this is also like so social housing is not just kind of like in isolation, we'll build this up and like continue on as normal where like people actually have permanent affordability and more housing stability. This is also about creating communities like deep seated communities. So this is one path of like also getting towards more pedestrian safety, bicycle safety, community ability to have more childcare centers, more community health centers, just community centers in general, um, moving into a place where we have a city that is more, more walkable and more community-based because we're not having to drive all the way to these new schools as they consolidate. Or for me, I have a kid that's in preschool. You know, I get to walk there from real change to go pick her up every morning and in the evening. It would be really nice if I could also live in the same neighborhood. Um, so we are creating that uh, that sense of stability for her, but I, I can't afford to. So it's also about like a vision of Seattle in the future where all can afford to live and thrive and where we're actually like boosting up also like small businesses um, and different workforces and different cre creative aspects. Like it's truly a vision for a, a different Seattle than we have right now. And uh, just quickly, um, this is KBRU 105.7 FM, a non-commercial, non-profit community radio station for uh, Southeast Seattle and beyond. Sorry, SCC.
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, what what goes on from here? Like, how do we take uh, the you know the measure that just passed and create the social housing developer? What what has to happen from a city end? Well, as we've said, the um, this is a this is a uh, quasi governmental entity, right? So the we have the city has eleven other PDAs already. So, for example, um, Skipta is a PDA, Community Roots Housing is a PDA, uh, the Pike Market Historic Preservation Development Authority. So, um, so we have these entities already. Um, they are they are independent in terms of whether the city uh, you know how the, how they interact with the city. So we don't typically um, uh, you know oversee their board. We don't hire their staff. Um, in this instance, and for example, we just created two years ago a cultural space agency um, PDA. So, so the point of these is to be able, as Tiffany said, um, to raise funds for acquisition and development of projects. They can bond uh, to help support the development of those projects. Um, but the city doesn't really have, except in this case, getting the actual initial board started and helping it get set up. The city doesn't have, uh, you know, their hands in the pot of how these operate. It will be really important though, for us to be very intentional about helping create a, a solid initial board because what we're talking about is an agency that will be responsible for, you know, potentially tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars in projects. Um, uh, PDAs can sue and can be sued. Uh, you know, there's a lot of technical you know, development, finance uh, mechanisms that will be in place. And so um, what we're taking the time to do right now is to make sure that this initial board has um, people who understand public housing finance, uh, who understand development, housing development, as Tiffany said, who understand, uh, you know, green building, uh, because that is part of the initiative language as well and who also understand what it is to be a renter in the city of Seattle. Um, we really want to make sure that that lived experience of, uh, you know, what it means to be in this housing market in the city, all of the challenges that it presents and uh, are reflected um, and, and understood by the board that is overseeing this entity. So that's that's our immediate work, um, and then as was mentioned, um, once this board is seated, uh, their work will be to draft the bylaws, make sure they are committed to the the idea of social housing, committed to what it can achieve and why um, the the goals and the outcomes are so important, and then uh, and then start looking for the right staff to help lead the organization. And then when you say that this organization can be sued, is the city under like, I mean, is the city responsible for that? Like who who is ultimately responsible for that if, if somebody comes for this organization? Yeah, so the, the board itself um, is responsible, right? And so um, part of why we want to make sure that this entity is strong uh, is so that it can the board can provide the proper oversight of the organization once it gets up and running. Um, and that's, uh, although Tiffany can speak more directly to the insurance and, and the protection for the entity, um, that is one of the powers that it has um, and one of the obligations that the board will have uh, to make sure that it is protected and that the assets of the organization are protected. Yeah, and then Ashley, I would just add to the, the first part of that question, um, something else that the city will need to undertake um, is this, I think it's section 12 or it's 13 in the initiative, um, but it's setting up a, a feasibility study, contrary to some of the opposition at the end of the campaign, um, the developer does not have eminent domain or the uh, right of first refusal. The initiative does, however, set up a requirement of a feasibility study every time that the city is looking to sell public land that does not go to a public use. If the city is selling land and they're going to give it to a school, that's a public use. The feasibility study in Initiative 135 is not triggered. If they're trying to sell city land and sell it to a private developer, 
that would then trigger the feasibility study and the initiative, and the city council would then be required to check out the feasibility of giving them land instead to the public developer for social housing so that that land stays in public hands. We did that because we do have a history in this city, a bad history of selling off public land to private developers, and that land is gone forever. I know that there have been some um, different uh, initiatives that the like council member Mosqueda has done in the last couple of years to, to try to change that. We wanted to make sure that also the voters are making very clear to the city that they don't want public land to be sold off to the private market. So it's also now up to the city council to figure out how to add that feasibility provision into, I don't know, council member, will that be the municipal code or whatever other governing documents there, there are? I'd love both of you to um, talk a little bit more about this. Are there, um, like, talk to me about specific examples of public land that's been sold off um, for other uses. Um, I, I can think of one, but uh, yeah, talk to me a little You're bit probably about thinking of the, of the Mercer Mega Block. I might be um, thinking of that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a great example, right? That was a huge opportunity for us. Uh, and uh, we, we missed the boat on that. Um, I think it's important that we um, acknowledge the power that we have as a city to protect citizens, to protect renters, to protect workers. Um, and when we, when we um, you know, lose an opportunity like preserving that land for public good, um, I think it's, um, I think it's a huge misstep. Um, and, you know, that, uh, and that's putting it mildly. So, um, so this is a chance for us uh, in the future when we have city owned land, uh, and we are operating in a time where we have a homelessness crisis, we have uh, a housing affordability crisis, we know that communities of color are getting pushed out of the city every day, uh, you know, uh, we are we we have growing wealth inequality in the city. I think there was something in the paper yesterday or today about how, uh, you know, working working class families are the number of working class families in the city are shrinking. Um, this is a problem uh, that a model like this can really begin to address uh, because we can use publicly owned land to take that that uh, you know that cost out of the cost of production of housing that working families can afford. Um, so that's part of the goal here. Um, and it is, um, I believe, incumbent upon us as city leaders to use every tool we have available to us to make sure that our neighbors can stay. And this is a really important tool. Um, we have something like 40 to 43 parcels of land in the city right now. Um, that could potentially go to something like, you know, social housing development. And so this gives us the opportunity to take a pause. Uh, if there's a conversation happening about selling off one of those 43 parcels uh, and really take a look at whether it is possible to use it instead to uh, begin to shrink our um, gap in, in the number of housing units that we need to create. And as Tiffany said, you know, I don't like talking about, you know, units of production. What we're talking about is building communities, mm -hmm. building homes for people uh, and building neighborhoods uh, where people can thrive and can stay. And the idea of doing something that assures permanent affordability is going to be really important going forward. And how does this um, either pair with or work in parallel to uh, you know, the, what was described as a historic investment in the Office of Housing. Um, I wanna say in the most recent budget, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, council member, uh, I think it was like $250 million into the Office of Housing. Does any of that go into this initiative? Um, how, how do those things work together? Well, I wanna be really clear that um, we are, not pursuing, uh, you know, previously allocated funding for uh, for the payroll expense tax or for the housing levy that is that is being uh, contemplated now. Um, you know, the the developer here will not be in competition with existing affordable housing programs. 
And I think it's important to understand that, you know, this is, this is not about uh, an entity that wants to build social housing competing with an entity that wants to build affordable housing. As I was saying before, the, the way we build affordable housing right now very often is with financing tools that um, include federal funding, which really restricts who can be there. The idea with social housing is not to restrict, uh, at least not specifically to you know, lower, lower income scales. So um, this is a new type of developer uh, looking to do a new type of housing, we do anticipate the need to look for progressive revenue. Um, uh, and, and that doesn't mean that this program is going to compete with, uh, with our existing housing developers. In fact, one could build either kind of housing and still be able to pursue what they've been doing in the past. And Tiffany, I know this is a question that you've gotten quite a bit um, in terms of like, where's the money going to come from? Do you want to uh, address that in terms yeah. of social housing is going to actually be developed? Yeah, so as we said, we weren't able to provide uh, a progressive revenue source because developers don't have taxing authority. Um, and that's why we put in the 18 months of startup support. We also wrote in the initiative too, um, just like the council member said, but also explicitly in the initiative, that this money for the startup or the developer cannot come from current allocations of affordable housing. So that's written into the initiative because this idea of scarcity that like it's going to be us competing with affordable housing while the private market is out there gobbling up the rental market like exponentially um, would have been really foolish and something we didn't want to give a potential opposition. So we wrote that in there because we do really believe that social housing is a yes and approach. Social housing should be working in tandem with current affordable housing providers to get as much housing off the private market as possible, not only for their clients, but for all Seattleites and frankly, all across the nation. So when it comes to funding, as uh, the council member said, working with the state to try to also get some extra seed money going while we look for a new progressive revenue source, we don't want a property tax, the coalition, we will not, we would not support that or an increase of the sales tax, which disproportionately hurts poor and working um, families. Uh, we want a progressive revenue source. We live in one of the richest cities in the entire world. There is not a lack of revenue, there's a lack of will. So if with the city council, which, um, you know, is potentially going to be really, really new um, in the next year, we will work with the city council, specifically with Council Member Morales, and if we can get something through the council, that would actually be a huge relief to me because initiatives are a lot of work. But if we're not able to get something from the council that, or the mayor or the state, then we will run another initiative for revenue. We've said that from the, the get-go, and people continue, like the Seattle Times editorial board, to, under, uh, to not take us seriously. They'll be the first to be invited to the press conference for the revenue uh, initiative. Hey. So, uh, oh, sorry. Well, <laughs> of course. Sorry, Ashley. Uh, yes, second to be invited. Um, but that's that's our plan. Like this, the coalition, real change. We're not going anywhere. If like city leaders won't do it, state leaders, even though housing and homelessness are like the top two issues in polls for years now, then we as the coalition will go forward and do that on our own. Um, and something I do feel like the um, anybody who's viewing this should know is that uh, Tiffany and I, while we are colleagues and friends, um, we have a very strict firewall, um, almost embarrassingly at some points because I find out things after other press people have. So I do demand a first uh, invite to that particular <laughs> press conference is all I'm saying. Okay, you got it. <laughs> um, so... There, there have been concerns um, and kind of going on this vein um, that the public development authority will potentially take votes from a few, uh, future housing levy. Um, are you guys concerned about that? And how do you want to address it? Yeah, I don't anticipate. Uh, uh, so we are beginning the conversation at council now about the housing levy. I'm not sure why uh, this would impact it. Uh, as as Tiffany said, as I've said, you know, the campaign was clear that they are prioritizing funding that isn't regressive. Um, and uh, so I, I think 
I don't I don't understand what the what the concern is, frankly. Um, you know, those conversations are going to be important. It is an important source of revenue for the other things that we do. Um, but I don't anticipate that this is something we're going to that, that that is going to be impacted by this initiative at all. Yeah, and we've we've told other council members like we do we don't even want to have a piece of the housing levy. We've said this like when we submitted the initiative um, a year ago or so, um, because we don't want to be competing, and we we mean that in practice and in words. Um, also, I'll just remind everyone that's listening that the housing levy usually always passes with like 65, 70% approval. Seattleites want to invest in affordable housing. They want to invest more in affordable housing. So the housing levy, which we endorse and support as uh, real change advocacy and um, as the coalition, we just know if we're honest with ourselves that the housing levy alone is not going to solve the crisis. The last housing levy didn't. Everything we're doing, regardless of those historic events, um, investments you spoke of earlier, Ashley, are not enough to get us out of this crisis. And once we acknowledge and accept that and are honest with ourselves and the public, then we can start talking about what other models can we bring in from internationally that are commonplace there, but not here, that can actually help us to alleviate the displacement of our Black, Brown, and low-income communities and the prevention of homelessness, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that's our focus. We're not going for those dollars. We do not want to compete ever for this because we should be working together because the private market is dominating everything and it's hurting communities all across the board. And uh, because we're at another 15 minute mark, this is KVRU 105.7 FM, a non-commercial nonprofit community radio station for SC Seattle and beyond. Yay. Um, um, so let's see, we've got some questions um, that are coming in online. Um, will this housing be for rental or for purchase? One person asks. Great question. Um, rental right now, um, but however, in the initiative, so if you look at the initiative, which is still on completely online at houseourneighbors.org, you can also find it at the, through the, the city. Um, but if you look at that, there's a must section and a should section. And in there, in the shoulds, it says that the board should explore home ownership models. The reason we did not write home ownership models in the initiative is because when we did extensive research of social housing models across the world, we only found two specific ones that had like a home ownership type model. And we didn't feel like that was comprehensive enough or that we could spend enough time drafting also a home ownership model. Meanwhile, we're simultaneously creating and like debating painstakingly who should be governing social housing. So it came to us. We're putting all of this effort and time and resource into like how the governing board should be. We're trusting them with this entity. They should be the ones that are deciding what homeownership models look like through a massive community input like session and um, experience. So we put it in there as a, a should, and we do encourage and expect the board when they have you know the time and capacity to explore those models and implement them. Um, Council Member Morales, um, I mean, do you want there to be these kind of affordable home ownership models? Uh, or, or are we going to focus on rental models in your mind? I would love to see a, a home ownership model included at some point. Um, I think, you know, to Tiffany's point, we got to get this thing up and running first um, and, and give the board the opportunity to understand the model, to understand uh, what other communities are doing. Um, but I think especially given the district that I represent, right, we have a lot of um, we have a lot of black and brown homeowners, elders, folks who are on fixed incomes who are very nervous about their ability to stay in the city um, because they're afraid they're going to get foreclosed upon. We have a lot of folks who would love the opportunity to own um, but have for any number of reasons, you know, been either priced out or, or have suffered from, you know, our history of racist, uh, policies that, that prevent folks from accessing community wealth and, com uh, uh, prevent folks from accessing assets that can build community wealth. 
Um, and so I think this, or build generational wealth. Um, and so I think that is going to be an important thing to shoot for, um, and would love to see that included at some point, but, um, you know, that, that may be a little bit further down the road as we, as we try to get this started. Mm -hmm. Um, so the next question I have from, uh, folks on the internet is, uh, is the plan to physically build more housing or to utilize already existing housing and turn it into social housing? And in either case, what are we looking at in terms of rent that folks can expect to pay? Yeah, great question. In the initiative, we wrote that the developer has the ability to acquire and build. And we did that purposely because we all know with inflation how much construction costs are um, and how long it just takes period to build housing in this country. So we wanted to make sure, and we also imagine in the first couple of years, the developer will be acquiring um, buildings to bring into the portfolio. Um, if I can just uh, tangentially say um, like a, a very concrete example for folks who are familiar with the Madkin apartments in Capitol Hill, um, we, there are tenants there that have been there between like five and 40 years. Um, the, the, the owner of the apartments um, was charging below market rent. Um, that individual unfortunately died. And then the building went to a family member who didn't want to uh, look it over and so put it out for, for a bid. And those tenants organized to try to get um, nonprofits to purchase it or, or the city to purchase it because they were afraid of being displaced because of the, the rents uh, increasing once private rentals, a private entity takes over. They were unsuccessful in that effort, but if the developer were in place at that moment, it could have went in and purchased that building, hypothetically, of course, and maintained all of that community cohesion that already existed within that building. But now those individuals with these rent increases that are coming are likely moving out of the city or moving abroad. And some of these folks have been together living in the same building for decades. So that's what we imagine acquiring, also building and that was the whole question, just that, right, Ashley, or was there a second part? Um, let's see. Um, yeah, no, I think that was the entire question. Um, let's see. And also there's uh, at least one person that we know who lives in that, uh, that specific Madkin apartment complex um, who's going to have to move out. Um, okay, so uh, next question from online is, if land is desired by a I'm not sure what a PIC is, um, but it says if land is desired by a PIC entity, oh, police training facility is a feasibility study required. Does the board have rights to determine if a public good or better used for other or better used for housing? I'm not fully sure what that question means, to be honest with you. Um, Basically, is a feasibility study required, I think, for uh, any particular piece of housing? Oh, um, PSC is apparently prison industrial complex. Sorry, it's getting translated for me in real oh. time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if a, a parcel of land comes up and the city wants to turn it into, yeah, a prison or yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I think maybe another way to translate this question is um, under what circumstances uh, does the public development authority have uh, to like take over a piece of land? Like what are the maybe competing interests uh, from a city's point of view about what a specific piece of public land can be used for? Mm -hmm. I can only speak to the initiative side. Um, and in the initiative, it, it we we do not have eminent domain and it does not have right of first refusal, just just period. Those things are not part of the, the governing structure of public developers in Washington state. Um, a feasibility study, I think this is a great question actually, and this is where, yeah, like Councilman Morales and like future city leaders will have to decide this and be on the record for it, um, is that if it is land going off to be sold for a non-public use, is our uh, is PIC public use? I would say no. Others might say something else. Um, but yeah, that would be up to city leaders to decide. But if it was being sold off to like a Ferrari company or like a gas station or a private developer that wanted to build luxury condos, then yes, the the feasibility um, the feasibility study would be triggered, and then council would have to do that and go on the record, either selling it still to a private entity or not. 
Councilmember Morales, um, what what do you think? Yeah, well, I in terms of the initiative language itself, um, you know, I think Tiffany is is right. Um, the question about what constitutes, you know, the appropriate use, I think, will be if it's not cut and dry. I think we'll certainly raise important questions um, that we would have to we would have to contemplate. I think, you know, my my first take would be that. Um, you know, it needs to meet several goals, right? We're still in a in a housing affordability crisis. We're still in uh, in a homelessness crisis. We're still in a wealth income uh, wealth inequality crisis. And so, if we are, um, you know, if we are looking to move forward as as one Seattle, dare I say, uh, then we need to be thinking about how we ensure that our neighbors can stay and and really that some of our neighbors can come back. Um, because so many people have been pushed out of this city. And this is a, a, a real opportunity for us to create, create this, the um, capacity, I guess, uh, for folks to be able to either to stay or to come back to the city and to really um, you know, re-engage with their community. Um, so I realized we have uh, a little bit less than a couple minutes left um, before you guys need to go, you know, continue on with your lives. Um, so talk to me a little bit about like what the next steps look like, like what, what are you going to be doing tomorrow or next week to make I-135 a reality in Seattle? Well, tomorrow we have a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> of these uh, of these implementers, so I have been convening, uh, as I said at the at the top, um, the different appointing entities. So we've got labor, we've got um, you know uh, folks from El Centro, we've got the Green New Deal Oversight Board, the Renters Commission, um, coming together to talk about um, you know creating some definitions, creating some expectations about what this board would look like. Um, you know, getting ready for what that first meeting, what the agenda of that first meeting would be so that everybody's really clear about, you know, what their roles and responsibilities are. Um, and then, as I said, you know, we are waiting still to, to see what happens at the state. Um, I am hopeful that we will get the, the operating support that we need um, and really start thinking about, you know, what is the city's obligation as well for uh, making sure that we are providing the kind of in-kind support and the kind of um, uh, funding that we are obligated to provide for these first couple of staff people, at least for the first 18 months. And Tiffany, I know you're not exactly one to uh, let something go. Uh, what, how are you going to be um, organizing around this in the coming months? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, how we're organizing is like how the council member said, but also, um, you know, social housing is not just like happening here in Seattle. It is a nationwide movement. Um, it is back again in front of the California state legislature. They actually, I think, have a panel right around now talking about that. We as the uh, coalition have been contacted by multiple areas across the United States for the past 15 months to talk about our the model that we put forward and how to win that. And even just like this last week alone, we've met with folks from R Rhode Island. Tomorrow we're meeting from folks from Illinois. We met with the Boston Teachers Union. So it's also about like the coalition and, and real change kind of taking on, if you will, like um, a best practices lessons learned sort of role on a national level to just like help guide folks that are looking to do this and replicate this there because the housing crisis is everywhere um, and we need to implement this model in order to address it. So organizing um, on that end as well, but then just also working um, with Council Member Morales, um, seeing if we can also revive the workforce development amendments that her office put forward last fall, specifically so we can create a union uh, pool of uh, folks that are in the building trades to build to passive house standards, because we don't have a large pool of those construction workers right now. We wanna make sure that those are great union jobs. So reviving those with the council member and yeah, just still uh, checking out the legality of different potential uh, progressive revenue sources and yeah, just building power um, in the grassroots and getting people on board this vision. 
Fantastic. Well, I've already kept you guys a minute or two over time. Uh, I really appreciate you guys hanging out with me this day. Um, and yeah, have a, a lovely rest of your days. But uh, thank you for taking the time to answer some questions about I-135. Yeah, thanks so much, Ashley. Good to see thank you. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.